Okay. Let's pop the. Try to not fall asleep. It's, it's not a great room for lighting, <laughs> so we're either in the dark or the screen can't be seen properly. So, um, thank you so much for coming along this evening. I think there may be some other people joining us over the course of the next while, but let's just make a start anyway. I think um, I'm. Richard Ling, so I'm a professor from within architecture and built environment um, uh, in this department. I think I know quite a few people in the audience, but certainly not everybody. So thank you so much for coming along. Um, our talk this evening is going to be from uh, Dr. Dita Lang from Denmark, from Aarhus in Denmark. I first knew Dita when she was a um, a professor in Alborg University in the north of Denmark, and I'm sure that Dita will tell you what she's doing now, which is which is now slightly different. Um, before I pass on to Dita, I was wanting to just say a few words about how we first met and why we've been doing this kind of research together over the course of the last few years. Before I do that, though, this is also part of a project which um, uh, Jennifer and Mingyu and I are undertaking which is a project called Brown to Green Transition. So I popped a little QR code on the bottom there. If you're interested in that project, it's um, certainly you can find out more on the website, but it's a project that's largely about, as the title suggests, a transition from former industrial land and areas to a kind of positive form of urbanism. And it's mainly in North and South Shields um, to the east of Newcastle. So if you would like to know more about that, if you click on the QR code, um, you can find out more. We do have a couple of events coming up as well within that. So we will have another public lecture at some point, but we're also going to be taking people on uh, <coughs> guided walks around South and North Shields where we can look at particular sites. So if you're interested in that, please just get in touch with any one of the three of us and we can we can add you to the list, that, that'd be nice. So I'll, I'll let Dita explain what she's going to be talking about in a moment. But the reason that I've called this, um, or the reason that we call this kind of putting people at the heart of the machine is that um, this is actually, it's either from the first or the second day that I had met Dita, probably the first day actually. And we were in Bremen for the beginning of a project that was about autonomous vehicles. Um, so we got taken on a tour of Bremen by people from the local council. And you can see there's Dita with a kind of black and white top. I'm not in most of these photos because I was taking the photo. Out. But um, it was an interesting day because this started as a project that was all about how technology is moving on so rapidly that in no time at all, we our, our cars won't need drivers and everything is going to be automated and everything will be fine. And then we had a slightly odd day where we got taken on, um, well, this is, this is a tram which isn't driverless, actually. I'd, I'd noticed that the, the trams on the metro in Newcastle are driverless, actually, but not like the ones in Bremen. But I suppose these are going through roadways and so on as well. So we got taken on a tour of the city and then um, <laughs> our leader in the project kept telling us, because he couldn't think of any other autonomous vehicles that were driving, he kept saying, of course, we're all used to driving autonomous vehicles, such as we're in an autonomous vehicle now, which is a lift going from the ground floor. And even at that point, you can see on our faces how excited <laughs> we were about getting into an autonomous vehicle. So we got up, and this was in, um, I think, University of Bremen that we went to that first day. And then we got a whole series of talks, which I'm going to say a couple of things in a moment, which are just intended to be... Um, uh, me introducing a bit of humour and levity into the situation, but they were doing impressive research, but it didn't necessarily put you at ease in terms of what was about to happen. So we got, we got shown um, kind of what they were doing. I remember at the time, I was hugely impressed that the university was full of these kind of touch screen things, just like, they were like 2001 monoliths that you could just, so they were giving all of their presentations on these. So I was immediately thinking, God, these guys really know doing. No? And they did have, um, this is from about three or four years ago now, so they did have technology that was quite impressive and it was saying that my friend David is 99% probably a person, you know, <laughs> and with, there's a Barbie as well, Barbie's 98% probably a person and stuff. So we kind of got shown that um, <coughs> and then we got to play around with um, 
virtual reality goggles. So that's my friend David, who I was working with on the project. In this particular demonstration, he was asked to guide, and you could see on the screen here, a representation of what he was looking at. It looked quite good, actually, when you had the goggles on. But it was really easy to start navigating it in the wrong direction. It wasn't really clear how the controls worked very much. And I think David and I both managed to... I think I crashed the boat, and I think David just, like, sailed out to sea when he was supposed to be doing something <coughs> else. But anyway, it was okay in the sense that it was like a demo of virtual reality. Then, though, we got taken on a tour of some other technology. And this bearing in mind is kind of saying, you know, things are moving on so rapidly that this is about to become pervasive in our lives. So this is um, uh, Dita, our colleague Rebecca and I were put into a group together and we had to go through this series of rooms, you know. So this is the first room we got taken into. So there was this chair where we were supposed to be able to land on the moon, I think, but it kind of, it didn't really work. You know, and so, so the screen kind of came on, but it didn't really allow us to navigate the technology much. Um, and you can see that how impressed we were on the day with the technology. But it was interesting because they were kind of telling us what they were trying to do. And from a research perspective, it was quite fascinating. But from a practical perspective, it still seemed a little bit limited. Um, we then got taken into a room where they were showing us how to use this robot arm that they were trying to use. They had like a little crystal swinging on the bottom, but it didn't work either, you know? So so this was like the second room we'd gone into and the technology, it kind of worked. Like the arm kind of moved a bit, but it wasn't really following instructions terribly well. But we're really polite, you know? So you kind of give them a round of applause and say, thanks very much, you know? Then though, they said, okay, and bearing in mind that we've just been two or three rooms where nothing worked, they then said, okay, what you're doing next is you're going to get into a car that will then drive itself around the car park. So we got taken out and they had a, this was like a prototype that they developed. So like the boot was all full of um, cables and numerous PCs and so on. They did have a safety driver in the vehicle and the vehicle as well was kind of equipped with loads of sensor technology on the outside of it. So it was a nice way of learning how the technology might work in the future. Um, and then we got taken on. I hope this will run. Yeah, so we got taken on a drive around the car park. I couldn't believe this. These are students' cars. <laughs> so it's like the car park was, um, it was quite dense. And they kept saying, you know, the students don't always park where they're supposed to. And I thought, but they're allowed to not park where they're, you know, they're allowed to be a little bit out, you know? Um, so we drove around. The, the safety driver, he had to grab the wheel quite a lot to try to make sure that we didn't just crash into cars. You can see the student here. So he's got a, a simulation of a small child. So he jumps out and then the car stops. So that demonstrated like a kind of like an emergency stop and so on. But I thought it was a, it started off as being a day where we were talking about how this technology was amazing. But by the end of the day, I think it actually introduced a lot of questions in our minds about why, uh, under what circumstances would the car make an emergency stop, you know? Like, what is the hierarchy of importance here and, and so on? But more importantly, there was this issue of, do we actually trust the technology around us? So um, the other thing that I would say on that day is that at previous meetings with people in Bremen, both David and I and our previous colleague Elizabeth had stood up and given talks where we would say things like, our research questions for this project are as follows. And the person leading the project from Bremen would usually just shoot us down and, you know, say this is not a research project, this is an applied piece of industry research and so on. But the first time I met Dita, she didn't know that that's what his reaction is to this. So I remember you stood up and gave that kind of presentation. I remember he just sat there and just took notes and so on. So I thought, this is quite good, actually, because we've got he kind of decided that David and I were not credible human beings, but he clearly <laughs> had thought there's somebody here that we need to take seriously. And, and I think that um, um, over the course of the last few years, we've worked on quite a few things together, like this and other projects and so on as well. And I think it's been, it's been a good experience for me, certainly. And you visited Newcastle, so I presume it wasn't that bad for you either. So, yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll let you um, take us through um, for the next little while, though, Dita. But... Um, 
Dita is a visiting scholar to the university and um, in my previous university when people were made visiting scholars what happened was they would be sent a letter that, which you got as well in my previous university a letter which was mainly telling you what you're not allowed to do so it was mainly you're not allowed to borrow books we will not give you any money and so on what you got from Northumbria was a really nice email from John Woodward mm -hmm. just saying how delighted he was that Dita joined Northumbria University and he was looking forward to meeting her on her next visit to Newcastle which kind of inferred that there may be numerous visits as well so I thought that was quite nice actually that the university seems to take visiting academics you know seriously as mm -hmm. they should so I'll now pass on to you though thank you Dita. so much okay <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just shift to my presentation. Uh, oops. Just press escape. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction. Richard and uh, Shioli, I also enjoy being here and uh, I've enjoyed working with you <laughs> over the years. Um, I'm uh, from Denmark, as Richard said, uh, and uh, I have a background in urban design uh, and a PhD in urban design and mobilities. And I worked with the uh, Auburn University, as Richard said, for many years as an associate professor and as head of research in, uh, in urban design. Uh, taught a lot of wonderful students. Uh, today I got the chance to chip in and Jennifer's uh, <coughs> supervision uh, with some of your architecture students here and I thoroughly enjoyed that. I didn't I didn't know I missed it so much. Um, but the thing is that uh, since this summer for approximately three months now I've, uh, I've worked with the, the consultancy, the Danish consultancy NIAS uh, as a specialist in sustainable mobility. Uh, I simply wanted to you know, uh, experience something else and challenge myself in, in another way uh, after many years in, in academia. So, uh, so this is what I'm trying out. And I thought that it's really interesting to uh, work in practice in these years with sustainable mobility uh, because so much is happening. And in Denmark at least, and I think it's the same here, it's such a politicized and contested field. How do we manage to make the green transition in mobilities happen? How do we meet the climate goals? Uh, what are the obstacles? Uh, how do we do it in a, in a way that's respectful towards the everyday lives of the people that would, uh, that would actually uh, have to use the places that we design? Um, yeah, but um, apart from that, my field of work has been a lot about uh, the design of, uh, of the spatial fabric of urban and suburban and rural territories. Uh, and especially I've been working with the, the spaces of our everyday life mobilities. So the spaces that all of us move through on a daily basis. Um, I work primarily, but not only in a Danish context, uh, and most of what you'll see today is from, from Denmark. Uh, that might be interesting in itself, and I'm eager, of course, to hear if you have different, far different experiences, or if you see any similarities, or whatever your reflections are on, on kind of the Danish context that I'm going to present. Um, the photos that you see here are from various designed and less designed uh, spaces in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, as you might see there. Okay. So there's something, just have to change it here as well. Yeah. Um, so this is a slide. I just want to briefly um, introduce uh, how I've been working uh, as an academic in research and also a bit about what I do today before I go into actually presenting the bits and pieces of the projects that uh, Richard invited me to present. So in my research, um, I've worked uh, both theoretically and uh, practically to combine mobility studies, which is a discipline, a field in itself, and urban design in an interdisciplinary approach in the effort to understand better how 
um, design, mobilities, and what we might call societal matters of concern, democracy, green transition, welfare, how those issues intersect and influence each other. Uh, in particular, I've been interested in questions of the spatial and social agency of mobilities design. Um, I've been interested in studying infrastructures beyond their technical capacity to seek to understand infrastructures as space and as form. That's the architect in me speaking there. Um, and also understand how infrastructural spaces afford our lives on the move. Uh, and also how they work in deep systemic ways uh, that might really uh, interact with our societies in, in different ways. And then I've been working a lot with the uh, designing for sustainable mobility transition, for example, by developing spatial strategies and spatial scenarios with partners from practice and also with my students at the urban design program at Olga University. Uh, as kind of um, a part of a research by design methodology that I've, I've tried to develop and apply. And uh, yeah, these are some images uh, from various activities that I, I thought might give a picture of uh, what I've been doing. And I have one more slide uh, because as part of that research, interested in inquiring into how ordinary infrastructural spaces afford invite or impede various practices and experiences. For example, how it feels to travel through a tunnel, um, how we inhabit those ubiquitous spaces, how we make sense of them in our daily life, uh, how they are entangled in what I've called sensory ecologies, their tactility, the sound of these spaces, how we see them when we travel through them, and even how we smell them. Uh, and I've used that to um, discuss and uh, yeah, discuss how we could potentially reimagine their performance in the light of the changing aspirations towards the good city that we've seen over the course of uh, the years and is, of course, continuously uh, a debated topic, uh, what the good city could be like and what the good public spaces could be like. Um, yeah, and now uh, I'm trying to kind of take that academic background into practice in a meaningful way. Um, I work with the consultancy NIAS, as I said. It's a huge Danish uh, uh, consultancy company with lots of different competences uh, in-house. I think we are more than 2,500 uh, people in, in Denmark working there. Uh, and I'm a, a senior specialist in sustainable mobility. Um, I work with spatial design and strategic development with a place-based and user-oriented approach. And what we are doing there we are, is that we are in a process of building a small interdisciplinary team that can help cities in particular uh, to develop and manifest strategies and plans and spatial designs that can drive the green transition in their specific contexts. Um, this is uh, for the cities in Denmark. It's particularly driven by the urgency of the climate crisis. Uh, we have a climate law in Denmark that cities kind of need to live up to within a very few years. Uh, they won't, and I think everybody knows, but uh, it's still kind of a, a guideline for many of the cities. Um, but it's also, of course, economic pressures of all kinds that kind of drive this agenda. For example, right now, the pressure on the provision of public transport in Denmark is, is a huge thing that we need to, to take care of. So what we do is that we, I mean, we work with all sorts of themes such as uh, walkability, uh, mobility hubs in the public transport system, the 15-minute the city that some of you have also mentioned today, uh, but also mobility practice, uh, practices, behavioral change, stuff like that. And, uh, and uh, also various forms of uh, data collection and data analysis. Yeah which is not my, my field. I'm a qualitative person, a, bio, a researcher. So, so that's what I bring in. But some of my colleagues, uh, fortunately, have uh, competences like that. So the point that I want to make today, and also building on uh, what Richard said 
earlier is um, is to open a conversation about how we study, understand, and design mobilities in the midst of transition processes. So there's sort of technological transitions going on. Uh, there's also the the urgency of a green transition going on. There might be other transitions going on in parallel that we need to take care of. Um, and in general, the approach that um, that we've sought to develop during my years in research is to draw out a conceptual and analytical potential from the fields of mobility studies, STS, that's science and technology studies, and urban studies, and combine that with urban design and architecture to help us inquire into the social and spatial agency of infrastructure design. And through this, uh, what I've tried to do is to find and develop, uh, along with colleagues, robust approaches and also deep reflection on the social and spatial effects of infrastructure, how it is deeply intertwined and implicated with the processes of urbanization, mechanisms of in and exclusion and spatial fragmentation, for example, but also how it includes socio-material aspects, uh, the material and spatial organization and localization of mobilities, the systemic complexities and the lived practices of mobilities. Um, so Richard invited me to talk about the Art Forum project that he just briefly introduced uh, with the, the images from our first meeting in Bremen in, in Germany. Um, and Art Forum, uh, Art stands for uh, automated road transport and the and the point with the project was to develop guidelines and tools for decision makers and planners to handle the advent of automated or driverless uh, vehicles uh, such as self-driving cars uh, it was a european interact project that was running from 2019 till 22 and it had multiple partners cities universities and ngos uh, uh, Albo University was one, um, uh, and and uh, I was leading our work on that project, and I'll show you a bit from it today. Um, this diagram shows the cross-sexual and multi-scalar approach uh, that we from Albo University tried to bring into that project to work with the city, with urban design, and with the social science uh, in one. So in Art Forum, uh, what we did was to provide research support on the implications of the application of autonomous mobilities in urban and suburban contexts. We did a case study uh, of a pilot project, a trial in Denmark, in the district of Olber East that I'll say a bit about. And then we also tried to go to a more general perspective and did a study of social science literature to look at the potential implications of autonomous vehicles on, on the contemporary city. Um, and this is an image uh, from the district of Olbo East in Denmark, where in 2020 till 21, there was a small autonomous shuttle driving on this uh, pathway. You can see it in the background here, this cute little thing. Um, and uh, what you just saw, saw was actually a transformation of this place. Uh, I'll just go back so you can see a bit because I want to make a point about that. Uh, this trial with autonomous shuttle buses was part of a larger suburban transformation process in, in this district. Um, it was a district, or it is a district that was planned, designed, and built in the mid of the 20th century, according to functionalist logics, traffic segregation, and functional zoning. Um, we know these principles from many places around the world, uh, built according to modernist CM thinking, and that has resulted in what I've called rational and utilitarian logics being frozen in asphalt and concrete. So, like very strong urban principles of how to organize a city uh, that we see in many places around the world. Um, so the shuttles were part of that context. Um, it was called the Smart Bus Project, and it was a proposal regarding how to work with this innovative mobility technology 
by introducing it as part of an urban strategic vision to transform this di district into what they called the suburb of the future. So similar to, you know, smart city visions uh, around the world. Um, so it was not a test of the technology itself or of its traffic functionality, but, but rather interweaved with these other urban agendas. Uh, it was, uh, the test was set up to um, investigate the technology as a means of pursuing practical and social purposes in this concrete urban context and as part of the ongoing social and urban transformation of the existing area. And uh, these are some of uh, some images from our qualitative research done on this trial. Uh, we followed the project for a period of four years uh, from before the shuttles were running, when the city was planning it and reconstructing the physical spaces to make to make space for this bus. And we followed it during the trial and also after it ended. And our research on the trial focused on what we call the meeting between people, city, and technology. Uh, we combined various methods, including site analysis and mapping, observations, focus group interviews, ethnographic interviews and go-alongs, and also a collaborative exhibition with the, the community. Um, and as such, what we did or tried to do was to begin to develop a community and place-based approach to understanding what's going on when a new technology like this one and a new infrastructure like this one is embedded in a real life context with real people, with everyday life, pedestrians and cyclists, with urban space and diverse mobility patterns and needs that it, uh, that it must meet. And uh, also in understanding the technology and the infrastructure in a transformation process that we illustrated on this timeline that includes social as well as spatial interventions seeking to handle some of the socioeconomic issues that actually developed in, in this satellite town not long after it was built. So... Uh, around the world, driverless vehicles are being investigated in various ways, um, and studies have revealed that there are a lot of important unresolved questions about where, how, and with what benefits the technology can be used. Um, in our study, which was a, a deep case study, we concluded on the quite rich and detailed context-specific insights with the eight lessons that I just listed there. And I'll just say a few words about them. Um, because in our interactions with people in the district, in, in the district, in and around the bus, actually technology was often not in the foreground at, at all. Um, rather, people were interested in what kind of opportunities for meeting other people or for benefiting their daily life uh, this would give them. And it doesn't come as a surprise in a way, but still a lot of technological studies put technology in the center and not people and everyday life in the center or the city in the center. So I want to stress that the embedding of the trial in the particular social and spatial geography of this district made it possible to examine these autonomous shuttles and their use as they unfolded in daily life with real humans. And this happened to happen with many encounters and quite a few quirks and ticks in the meeting between technology and city and people. Uh, I like to think about this as tales of entanglement, maybe, uh, between different people, uh, spaces, technology, and also the strategic aims and visions from the city. And as you can see, I mean, just from this snapshot on the pathway, we have we have the autonomous bus there and somebody on a horseback and, you know, various people kind of interacting with this thing, this technology in their daily life. Um, so technology and the infrastructure did by no means work in a vacuum, we could say in this case. It was contextualized socially as well as spatially. People and the physical space may in technological images of the future sometimes seem as barriers to a smooth and frictionless smart future that would rather have people to be like particles to be shuffled around in rational systems. Uh, but what we saw in this stu study was the stuff that actually makes a community, social life, culture, place, and identity. 
And we saw in particular people forming new connections around the shuttles in a way mediated by the technology and by the shuttles. And we saw the space being transformed and experienced otherwise through it. Um, so indeed, we found that the interactions that took place in and around the studies, uh, in, in and around the shuttle, sorry, may spark a curiosity about how driverless mobility can be brought into play as an element in socially sustainable mobility development and also in urban development. Perhaps a community approach could be further developed, a collaborative approach integrating mobility, local community development, social work, and maybe the quality of public spaces. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that particular case there and move on to a broader perspective on autonomous vehicles, but it's one that carries on with the focus on the intertwining of automation, city and people. Uh, this is the other part of the work that we did in the Art Forum project. It's the social science literature study of the potential implications of autonomous vehicles on our cities and the uncertainty or the unsettledness of those uh, prospects where not only the technological development continues to be dynamic and with twists and turns and holes, as, as Richard just suggested, but, but not least, sorry, how various place-specific and social and cultural factors uh, may influence heavily the potential realization of any future scenario with the autonomous vehicles. Yeah. So AVs in the future city, uh, what, what could that be about? Uh, is, it a, is it a future with smart vehicles that can drive themselves? Um, in the current situations, it, seem, it seems that we cannot just look to the past and simply project that into the future. And this question about autonomous vehicles in the future city is therefore a rather open one. Uh, and it's answered in various ways out there in the literature. There are different types of future autonomous vehicle imaginations out there. And we may roughly summarize these in, in some scenarios. Um, on the one end of the spectrum, on the top here, we could have a utopian scenario where AVs, autonomous vehicles, are assumed to be electric and it's assumed that people share them as part of a new mobility service system. And in this utopian scenario, this would lead to a better urban future, uh, to cities with fewer cars, more green space, more walking, more biking. But on the other hand, there's also a dystopian scenario that we can find in the literature. Here's, here, uh, ABs are not shared. They are not necessarily electric, but gasoline powered and privately owned. Uh, this leads to cities where empty zombie cars roam the streets, the extensive road networks. Car dependency, as we've known it, known it through the 20th century, continues. There's less space and possibility for active mobility, cycling and walking, and so and the cities continue to sprawl. So the question is, uh, will there be a future with AVs? That's the first question. And if so, what will that future be like? Will AVs help us solve key problems of the contemporary city? Will they be connected, electric and shared? And is this technology really as straightforward and risk-free as some of the bright utopian images tend to suggest? We could uh, take a look at the car-based city of today to the right in, in this drawing that we produced for the project. Uh, AVs may be on their way. They may promise to help solve congestion and safety issues. They uh, may promise to be smart, to bring a bright future. But similarly, we dare to say, as illustrated on your left, Scholars and professionals and the first bits of the car industry throughout the 1800s would see the bright advantages of the very first stages of small horseless carriages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Such a carriage would have no need for the smelly and demanding and noisy horses of the past. They were self-moving, they were automobile. However, as we know, the replacement of horsepower with gasoline has received much criticism 
not least of planners and politicians, willingness to allow the car-centric city to grow and thrive in spite of the serious problems it caused alongside the advantages of swift private mobility. Um, because a rough characteristic of the car-based city includes both that the car allows us swiftness and comfort, privacy and flexibility and going, in principle at least, anywhere at any time. But the car's dominance in our cities and in our mobility systems also include unsustainable practices, mobility, injustice, serious health issues, staggering numbers of fatalities, space inequality and urban sprawl. So um, how do we at this point in time learn from the development of the car-based city? How do we avoid ending up in a future that reproduces the bats of the automobile or maybe even produces more troubling situations as some scholars would warn us? And I have uh, one here, which is um, mobility scholar uh, Mimi Scheller. Uh, she used to be a professor at Lancaster University. And now she's in, based in the US. And she brings such a warning uh, about the future of mobility and the transition away from carbon dependence and the polluting technologies of the past. She writes that even if or when this green transition finally does take place, we may end up in a problematic situation. We may find ourselves depending on other technologies that are perhaps green, uh, but culturally and socially problematic in ways that are even more troubling that, than the technologies of the past. So this warning could spur us to seek to understand more about what AVs might eventually mean to our cities, to seek to contribute critical and constructive reflection, to understand more about what is actually facing us here. In other words, maybe to consider both the potential benefits, but also the potential challenges of a future with autonomous vehicles. Um, I want to say a bit about the automobility system, uh, and I want to use um, sociologist John Uri, uh, who was also a professor at Lancaster University, and he's, he's written a lot about the automobility system. Uh, conceptualizing it as a socially and economically locked in system in which our economies and societies and everyday life are locked into the car. Billions of actors and processes he shows in his work related to technological developments, to lifestyles, markets, industries, land use, are so closely connected to automobility in a socio technical system that it is very difficult to break away from. And because of these many interlinked elements and interests, Uri has, uh, Uri has called this system a Frankenstein-created monster that forces people to juggle fragments of time so as to deal with the temporal and spatial constraints that it itself generates. Yeah. So wrapping up, uh, on our, okay, there's some, wrapping up on our work on autonomous mobilities, my attempt here is to invite uh, all of us to connect autonomous vehicles with the critical reflection. And I want to highlight three areas of reflection here. The first one is autonomous vehicles in system transitions. We've seen the assumptions behind the most bright imaginings of the future with AVs, that they are shared, electric and connected. And these assumptions are in more or less explicit terms behind many scenarios that foresee the benefits of autonomous vehicles, also from, or in particular from the industry. But each of these innovations requires systemic transition in itself. For shared mobility, for example, we've seen, we see that in Denmark, I assume that we see it here as well. We've seen that it's very complex to break away from private car ownership at a large scale uh, the cultural, emotional, practical, and infrastructural attachment that most of us experience and the dependency that we have on our private cars, uh, car use, is one of the core lock-ins of the automobility system. So a transition to sharing may not be straightforward at all. So what happens to the future of mobility if uh, AVs are not that, if they are not electric, shared, and connected? The second area of reflection is about autonomous vehicles as a potential for solving problems in the city. 
Um, will AVs help us solve problems of the car-based city, such as the social inequalities embedded in the system, the space inequality sprawl, the excessive land use for roads and parking, and the serious safety issues of the current situation? Um, we cannot approach autonomous vehicles in a vacuum or as a technical question alone, separated from cultures, spatials, uh, spaces, social practices, markets and policies. Technological and social implications co-develop in intricate ways and potential benefits of AVs might often be based on various assumptions that we cannot predict and thus they should not be considered a straightforward matter, of course, the literature argues. If AVs enter the city on the current conditions of the car system, without changing the underlying problematic forces of automobility, may these and other problems then be maintained or even worsened. And third and last area of reflection, and perhaps a more positive note to end on, the approaches we may take to face the uncertainty of a future with, with autonomous vehicles. What do we want autonomous vehicles to be? Um, Scholar Jack Stilgo asserts that autonomous vehicles are not settled yet. Perhaps we can shape autonomous vehicles to the futures we want, as he suggests here. Um, how can we avoid getting drawn into planning for the technology rather than for the inclusive, sustainable kinds of societal outcomes that we want to see? How do we place socially and ecologically just mobilities at the center of transport futures rather than technologies. Can we, in that process, regard that yesterday's solutions are not sufficient, that the assumption of stability no longer holds, and perhaps find ways to move from a predict and provide paradigm that has been dominant in our approach to planning for the future of traffic uh, throughout the 20th century, and uh, we've been forecasting traffic growth and provided the road space, the asphalt for that growth throughout the 20th century. And can we, can we move towards what uh, Philip Christ, who um, works with innovation and foresight at the, at the International Transport Forum, what he suggests, uh, that we find new ways of shaping mobility, one that does not predict and provide, but one that decides on just and sustainable mobility and provides for that. So on that note, I want to zoom out from the issue of automation in mobility to the broader picture of uh, sustainable mobility transitions and show you a few statements on the alternative cultures and habits and thinking of mobility futures that are being debated currently. Um, you may also, of course, be, be involved in some yourself. Uh, but what I highlighted here is the efforts to make shared mobility rocks, making sharing rather than owning a new credo in mobility. Uh, I also showed an example of the critical stance to techno-fixing the future and a call for boring, well-known solutions such as public transport and cycling uh, and car freedom, we could maybe say, as the opposite to car dependency. Uh, and I have a picture there that you might also know, an image of what the car-based city may actually feel like for a pedestrian. So, very last slide, and in conclusion, I briefly want to return to the point. Um, what I wanted to try with this uh, presentation was to highlight our work on theoretical and empirical insights on the social and spatial agency and implications of infrastructure and technologies when it manifests in local realities, in cities, and when implicated in the complexities of urban transformation and transition processes of making futures. Um, and since I work with design, I, I have a keen interest in also trying to contribute some reflections for the design field here. And I think as designers, we could work constructively and critically with how a bridge that we design or a mobility plan that we are involved with generates both spatial and social effects. In particular, when working with mobilities, there seems to be still a need to push our work 
beyond a technical, managerial, rational. And this has a deep future and intervention-oriented urgency, I find. Asking, for example, will deep social issues remain with a transition to greener ecological futures? For example, with green infrastructure designs, will they even worsen? Will or will new problematic side effects be created? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That was really, that was really brilliant. And, and I think that um, there are a couple of things but before. I'm sure there will be questions. Um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to pop the light on? Just yes, behind, you? of course. Just, um, I'm sure there will be questions. But what's kind of struck me over the years working in a couple of the ill coming. Okay. Um, a couple of schools of um, <laughs> architecture and environment is that um, this kind of research sometimes struggles to find a place in the mainstream of like education of architects or education of um, uh, planners or education of technologists. And I don't think there's anything in this presentation that would actually be out of place in certainly any of the courses within the department that I work in. I would also say that the work, and I'm not just saying this because you're here, because I've said it before in, in other forums, I think the work that Dita and our team did in Albert East was one of the most in-depth, kind of qualitative, long-term mm -hmm. studies that, that I've seen. And it was so far away from, at the beginning of Art Forum and another project I was involved with, looking at KPIs for, for key performance indicators for autonomous vehicles, they were all about how many cars can we sell, how many vehicles can we sell, how many do we have on the road, how many, ro how many roads have we managed to isolate and so on. And I thought what was amazing was that you didn't reject that, mm -hmm. but you went into it in a kind of open way and we found out that actually most of these indicators should be social or or socioeconomic rather than technological, you know. So I, I thought that was is enough about what I think though. So do you have any does anybody have any questions any, or any points they would like to make or any observations at all? I have uh, one question and one observation if I could. Uh, one is uh, you said uh, culturally culturally the word there, yeah, culturally problematic. Yeah. If you could give a couple of examples, or maybe you did, and I did not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I referred to Mimi Schiller's work there. Um, sorry, I'll just find the quote. I think she's the one using it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we're still <coughs> speculating here, right? If. Um, if when we, uh, let's say, employ new strategies, new technologies to bring about the hope for green transition, mm -hmm. what, what are... Uh, just thank, you, thank you, sorry, I've been having a really interesting thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, what, could be, what could be the futures arising from that? And are there social and cultural problems connected to those futures? Yes. It, it could be that we would be locked into uh, patterns of inequality that are even stronger than today. What if, for example, if uh, autonomous vehicles are still privately owned and uh, you can buy access to road space, you can program your car with the money you have to drive faster and I take mean, up I the space. You could choose the routes I will be following. Yeah, whereas okay. the poorer people couldn't. Okay. Maybe that would, you know, en enlarge the inequalities That's that we already it. see embedded That's in the right. automobility system. I think that right. could be one example. Very good example. Yeah. Very good example on this. And one little observation was we have said safer than humans. Yeah. I think you mean safer than human driven cars. Is that Pro the, probably? Uh, oh, yeah. There, there's uh, the slide after this program. Okay. It says safer Thank than you. humans. Uh, it, it is a kind of. Uh, yeah, safer than humans. I think what you mean there is safer than humans. Human drivers. Yes. Yeah. That's what you mean. Because yeah. safer than humans gives a very different. Yes. Yeah. Good just point. point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Does any of this? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. First of all, thanks very much for the informative and presentation. And by the way, I really liked the way that the slides are produced. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> um, so my question really is, um, are there any changes um, in terms of the attitudes of the people in the project that um, you've worked on? So for example, I assume when we started to have the uh, autonomous vehicles in that area, um, it may involve some reconstruction of the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then, a lot. Yeah. Uh, or people resisting. And then after, you know, it has been in place for a while, mm -hmm. do people's attitudes change? Um, I think the picture is really varied uh, uh, in terms of uh, the attitudes of people. So we spoke to, I think, a total of 150 people during the course of the project um, out there. And uh, in the beginning of the project, before the shuttles were running and while they were doing the construction work on the pathway, we did, uh, I think, three focus group interviews to understand more about the... Uh, the attitude of people and the expectations towards this project. And at that point, people were, I think, seeing a lot of challenges, uh, um, perhaps even being a bit afraid of what this technology would bring to their pathway. And I think the reason is really context specific, because what you see here, you see kind of a very varied use of this pathway. It's a soft mobility. Uh, route through this district where people would, or children would play and you know walk to school alone and learn how to cycle. Stuff like that would go on there, and and the adults living in the area and working in the area, they would kind of see for themselves, you know, this huge bus coming in and and also maybe not trusting the technology uh, beforehand. How it turned out was then that this bus, and I didn't tell you, but it it um, it ran so slowly. Uh, the, um, it was, I think, the average speed was 8.4 kilometers an hour. So, I mean, you could cycle past it like that, right? Uh, even walk if you were really fast, because it had to stop all the time also. So it was so slow, and it, it had such a defensive uh, protocol of driving. So if you threw in, if I did this in front of it, it would stop immediately. Mm. Right. So... Mm. Uh, and also if a leaf fell from, <laughs> fall from a tree or if a pigeon uh, flew in, in front. So lots of stuff like that was going on. And over time, people learned that, of course. And children, especially young teenagers, I have to say, they also <coughs> played along with it. So it was kind of fun to, you know, tease the, tease the bus by walking in front of it. And then it would stop immediately. <laughs> and actually, I think that... The biggest sort of uh, problems that got out of that was for the people inside the bus, because yeah. the abrupt braking was really um, uncomfortable, and actually a few people got injured for real uh, because it stopped so so quickly, right? Um, so those were also some of the, the learnings, and we've I mean we've published a, a transport paper on, on some of that stuff. Um, that I didn't highlight today, but it says here, low speed and abrupt heart breaking uh, was, was really part of it. Um, I think another important thing maybe to highlight in, in relation to your question is what we call the operators. Maybe a better English term would be the stewards, because the bus was autonomous on SAE level three, which means that there has to be a steward or a driver in there all the time, like the, the video we saw from Richard from Bremen, there has to be someone in there to, to be able to take over control at any time. Um, so there was a, a woman or a man in there at any time, and it turned out that those operators, the stewards, they they got a, a really sort of particular and I think even beautiful role of you know community care. Yeah? yeah. And I think actually maybe the biggest benefit for the community and the social life was that that bus turned out to be an intimate social space where you could always find somebody to talk to, especially the children. There's a lot of uh, disadvantaged children in this area. And, and they would go in there you know, at night and get warm and talk to a grown-up that they would trust, and all sorts of stuff like that happened, um, which in a way is paradoxical because it's supposed to be driverless. <laughs> but, but the biggest community value was the driver. The human, yeah. In relation to that, though, um, Dita, not though, mm -hmm. but I remember in the early part of this and the PAVE project, there was quite a lot of discussion from transport operators saying, 
that one of the benefits that they saw of the vehicles was that they wouldn't need to pay drivers anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there seemed to be this idea that... But that was also, sorry. Yeah. And I kind of thought, mm. well, the vehicles cost quite a lot, so you get, they're going to have to run for quite a time before you make back yeah. the cost. But some of my colleagues in my previous university whose expertise was in like network modelling and so on, mm. they went down to the Scottish Parliament and made this argument said, this is brilliant because we can sack all, but they didn't say, but this is brilliant, we can sack all bus drivers. But it's what they said, and um, the members of the Scottish Parliament understandably reacted really badly to that, because they were kind of saying, "But well, you're telling us that you want to spend millions of pounds on technology so that we can put people who don't earn that much money out of work, you know? Yeah. So I thought, so then, but early in the project, we were kind of saying, you know, maybe the driver could do something else. And, I remember the transport operators were like, yeah, okay, that's good. But you could automate disabled people getting on off the bus. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was quite powerful, actually, that people yeah. liked their, their, their there was still to, a human on the bus. I have to say, I think it's also paradoxical because one of the reasons why the city of Olbo wanted to test out a driverless bus here is because of the economic feasibility mm -hmm. that they see in the future of not having a driver on a, on a route like this. And in Denmark right now, it's being debated a lot because we have lots of economic pressure on the public transport system, uh, that ah, once we get the driverless vehicles, then everything will be solved because we don't have to pay pay the salary, right? And uh, yeah, I, I think because maybe public transport is not just about shuffling people from A to B, maybe it's also about care. Maybe it's about meeting other people. Maybe, maybe spaces like that, the intimate space in that small bus where you're actually face each other like we would do around the table here. Um, maybe maybe that space is there's no authority to kind of handle conflicts and uh, problems in that space, then what, what what's it about then? Uh, can we do that? I just think a lot of question arises and, and we can only speculate because we didn't get to study that here. We had the we had the steward there at all times. So so we haven't seen it without uh, in a Danish context. Thank you, Lodita. That was fantastic. Thank you for inviting me, Rachel. Thank you, Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.